Thank you all for coming to today's lunchtime talk in science and math. As we sort of anticipated, the uh, participation by students is a little lower than usual, but we do have some represented, so thank you and thank everyone for coming. You may notice my shirt today is uh, CU Boulder, so it is my alma mater, but also uh, our speaker today is from CU Boulder, so I wanted to make sure that he felt welcome in coming to Adams State. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So he's coming from CU. He's the uh, PI in the Physics Education Research Group, as well as uh, CU's STEM Learning Center, something of that nature, as well as a host of many other things. Uh, so if you please help me welcome our speaker. Thank you, Matt, and uh, Christy as well. It's, it's such a pleasure to connect with you all here. This is my first stint down to Adams State. Um, let me know if you can't hear me either on the audio or in the audience, although... Okay, thank you. Teacher voice. Um, and interestingly, I, I, I love coming to an institution uh, that was founded as a teaching uh, institution. I uh, first and foremost identify myself as a teacher and an educator. I, I find um, our investment in education as one of the most profound forms of engagement that we have in uh, our current society and in our future. But I hope to um, articulate that, um, provide some tools and discussions. The other agenda that I have here, it's um, uh, not particularly a hidden agenda. I would love to develop more collaborations between uh, my campus, uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, and uh, Adams State. In fact, I'm very interested in creating a statewide system or network in higher education. And there are lots of um, different histories behind the different organizations that we have in education. Um, and as a result, they, um, in addition to different histories, but also current pressures that exist on them, there's lots of incentive for us to focus inward. And I want to spend some um, explicit time thinking about turning out. So I'm going to spend some time thinking 30,000 foot view, maybe 50,000 foot view on the nature of education itself, the particular role in higher education, and then what it is that we do in the classroom as students, as educators, as participants within uh, these systems. So, um, I'm also a huge fan of uh, interactions, so do feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions that you might have um, throughout the talk. So, um, well, we'll get into it. So, um, as Matt mentioned, I am involved in a, a wonderful research group, and I draw all the brilliant ideas from my colleagues here. We have a huge number of, of faculty um, in the physics department. I did, uh, Valerie Otero's in the School of Education. Uh, here and Carl Wyman is uh, still affiliated though now at Stanford um, uh, and he was instrumental in founding this research group and, and my own hire um, to launch this research to do something difficult and get involved in education and he's been instrumental in advancing education now um, but also the people who do tremendous work we have uh, great partnerships with teachers um, staff in the classroom student workers lots of postdocs and scientists and of course a fair amount of funding that helps us achieve these ends this is in uh, people who are studying conditions that support or inhibit student learning in physics. But that's a small subset of the grassroots movement for a community that's involved in studying how students learn math, how students learn biology, what are the conditions that support or, um, students' engagement in computer science, um, folks in psychology thinking about what is unique about the STEM fields that makes it so darn alienating um, for uh, particular populations of students. And so these are brought together, this so-called discipline-based education research community through this um, Center for STEM Learning, which I'm very proud to uh, be affiliated with uh, here. And so these are folks I'll be representing a bunch of their work. I won't speak for them. The errors are entirely mine and not theirs. Um, let me begin, however, by asking a simple question with profound implications and something that's somewhat difficult to answer. Why education? Why do we invest in education? Why are you personally all here, like literally here in this room? at this institution? Why is it that our society invests formally a um, trillion dollars a year in our education system, roughly split between higher ed and K-12, a little more in K-12, and then of course another three or four trillion in um, re-education of students, interestingly enough, in our, our systems. So why is that, and it's not to say that it's a money game, that's just simply um, um, proxy for describing how fundamental and important it is in our society. So why personally or why societally? It's not a rhetorical question. So pause for a moment and think about it. Yeah. It improves the standard of living. It improves the standard of living for society, yeah. 
In fact, it's a, a fundamental form of investment for a student to improve her or his own life um, in that, um, as well as for society. Yeah, you had a comment in the back maybe, or no? Aha, uh -huh, there's no other place I could see myself being. There's an inherent joy, maybe, in learning, <laughs> or certainly there's an inherent habit in learning in that, but it's, it's somehow fulfilling for you as an individual to be doing this. You're choosing to do this, which I think is wonderful. I think it's spot on. Yeah? Be able to better ourselves and better our communities. That's exactly right. This is... Um, uh, mechanism by which we invest. I tease my astrophysics colleagues that they're busy looking at stars where the light's coming from billions of years ago and I say you know look at the future you know look up in the uh, look at the past you look up at the sky you want to look at the future come into our classrooms. This is how we better ourselves and better our society um, systematically. It's a formal form of investment by usually the established often the older um, in investing in uh, those coming into a program the younger. Why is, it, um, why is it in every State of the Union address from the President of the United States, him talking about education or STEM education? There's, there's some lip service to improving an individual's life, but as a political entity, what is he mostly talking about? Or why is it that STEM is more important than philosophy or history right now in the national discourse. And I don't believe that it is. I'll come back to that. Yeah? Uh, because of the implications it has on our technological advancement. The implications so that... The things we're going to be using in the next few years rely on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Without that, we fall below the global curve. Uh-huh. The global curve in... I, I, I think you're spot on. <laughs> um, Science and math scores, but those are performance indicators. And it, it's, it's the society we live in is increasingly found, you know, sort of technologically. It's really amazing to think about what we carry in our pockets right now as a form of technology um, in that way. But usually the way this uh, rhetoric comes about is from workforce and economic development, that we're worried about falling in terms of our uh, economic prosperity um, as a society. And it's usually, I mean, if you're going to go into politics, which for those of you who talked about enhancing students' lives and improving our society and engaging, I implore you to please go into uh, politics because the, the rhetoric from politicians is all about jobs, 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 and I'm not opposed to that. But it's interesting to think about that's the driving enterprise for investment behind uh, these, whereas uh, history, philosophy, a liberal education is, is essential in helping you think how to think, knowing what these technologies are going to be useful for and maybe which ones we should and shouldn't develop. We can sort of engage uh, decently in that discussion as you want. But I, I love where you all started, and this is where you got to. This is my priority list, and you can make any number of buckets or basis set um, by which we think about this, but I think it's a fundamental mechanism by which you improve an individual's life, and whether that's um, because it provides uh, foundational fulfillment for you or basic forms of literacy. Learning how to read as a child opens up literally worlds to you. It allows you to engage. I'll talk a little bit more um, about this. Um, it's also societal empowerment. It's fundamental. Both standard of living. If, if I improve your life, Matt, it turns out my life will get better too because we're in an in interconnected system here. Thankfully, because that's actually how humans have developed and evolved is, is to create community. Our communities are interdependent interdependent. And it's so core and so well understood in our society that it gets written into the founding documents of this country, which is that we don't have a simple democracy. We have a representative democracy, and it's a democracy based on an educated and informed citizenry. And I joke we should try it sometime. <laughs> and then, of course, there's workforce and economic development um, here to sort of advance. And to me, this is the priority order list, but not what you see rhetorically. And that's mine. It's just an editorial there. Meanwhile, given this is so fundamentally important, what are the challenges that we're facing? And I think a lot about this on the national scale. So you'll see these data that we need to improve education. And what's remarkable is these data are outdated. These data are from 2006, a decade ago now, but they're still cited today, even though there have been more recent studies of 15-year-old performance by the OECD and PISA that the U.S. ranks 21st out of 30 in science and 25th out of 30 in mathematics. Now, um, 
this is simply a measuring stick. It's a question of what is it measuring, and you could you know, argue that maybe the measurement's broken, and there's some arguments actually behind that. But you could also say this represents um, our lack of future capacity to invest in technological development or the foundational fun, uh, infrastructure in our society. And so it's really remarkable that the powerhouse of Liechtenstein is outperforming the United States um, here so dramatically in what's going on. And, other, and we can talk about why this is. And I'm, uh, well, so we can talk about, so this is a lot of the rhetoric that's been driving um, uh, work, especially at the federal level in things like the ESSA, elementary and secondary um, uh, or it's now Every Student Succeeds Act. It keeps changing its name. Formerly, No Child Left Behind. Um, we need more and better teachers. This is where y'all are at. So uh, my field is in physics. So in physics, if you, took high school, if you took physics in high school, which makes you lucky in the United States, among other things, more likely than not, you had a teacher who had neither a major nor a minor in physics. Two out of three high school physics teachers has neither a major nor a minor in physics. And I'm not saying that that's a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition. Um, to understand the content in uh, uh, sophisticated ways um, here. And then most teachers don't stay. And then finally, we need more and better STEM graduates. Again, this is out of a uh, report that one million more STEM grads. By 2018, this was actually cited in 2010. Um, politically now, they've just said in the next, next decade because A, we can't achieve it by 2018 and we'll never achieve the next decade because it's always 10 years off. But um, we need a, this was from the Center for Workforce and Education in Georgetown, um, looking at our economy and saying, wait a sec, what are the next steps in our economy? So this is, these are the forms of rhetoric that have been used to say we need to invest um, in education in our society, particularly in the STEM fields. Um, to me, this is about quality of life um, for all. It's not about workforce development. If we get quality of life right, if we get societal engagement right, workforce will follow. It'll be a natural byproduct. If we get the workforce right, it's not clear that we enhance standard of, of living. And so this is really important that we think about where it is that we lead with. So meanwhile, we're in a changing landscape, particularly in higher education. So you know all these things, but there are educational challenges and opportunities that I'll just sort of briefly review. We have new models and modes of education, which is both, it's a double-edged sword, an opportunity and a threat for what's going on. Um, there's a, a shift in public will around higher education itself, and of course the financial structures in higher education. So we happen to be in, in um, Colorado loves being um, sort of nationally leading and cutting edge. And in fact, in terms of funding, we are nationally leading um, in our lack of funding for public higher education. Um, this is a, um, uh, and this is for uh, public research universities, but it's true. Um, the state of Colorado is projected in the next five years to be the first state to go to permanently zero funding for public higher education. Illinois is currently at zero, and it's, it's destroying Illinois because there's a fight between the legislature and the governor right now. They haven't passed a bill. Um, hopefully that gets resolved. But um, giving the funding models of our state, our state is scheduled to go to uh, zero public funding for higher education. So the question is, how do we adapt to that? And um, when people say that the cost of education uh, has gone up, that's actually, uh, it's well-intentioned, but it's a misnomer. The President of the United States came to uh, our campus you know, for uh, the election last cycle, shook his finger at us and said, get your cost under control. I think he knew better, but he was wrong. Our costs are not out of control. The cost of educating a student at the University of Colorado and public institutions of higher education over the last 20 years has largely remained flat, accounting for inflation. Tuition has tripled. But the cost of educating a student has remained flat. How is that possible to reconcile? And the question is, who is paying for education? Whereas three out of four dollars for public higher education used to be paid for by the state, now it's one out of four dollars, and the students are being asked to pay the burden there. We have shifted from higher education being a public good to a private opportunity. And that's a dramatic shift, and it's partly dependent on public will, where people are saying, wait a sec, is it worth it? Is it a return on investment? Don't buy the hype. Go do it online. And I profoundly disagree with these sentiments that are being expressed. Let me just briefly talk about the educational value here S on the same terms that I actually don't think that it's worthwhile, which is financial here, to talk about. I think that um, education actually empowers people's lives and makes their lives better. But uh, here's some outcomes of education. If you get a bachelor's degree, on average, you will earn a, a million dollars more in your lifetime than if you don't have a bachelor's degree. 
independent of field, as a matter of fact. Turns out, you'll live five to seven years longer with more education. You'll live a healthier life. You're at a much lower risk of severe disease. You're more socially engaged. And these are kinds of uh, 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 perspectives that you uh, hand off to the next generation. Even for children who are not themselves college educated, although you're more likely to go uh, to college if you yourself, if, if your parents went to college. Um, these are things that create. And so to me, that's a virtuous cycle, that this is a form of investment not only in yourself, but in society writ large. This is also, I mean, it's a fundamental form of infrastructure. This is why there is every committee in Washington has an education component to it nearly um, in this way. This is why industry is investing tremendously in educational enterprise. This is why it's considered an issue of national security, um, as well as the founding of the, anybody know when the US Department of Education was founded? Roughly. I mean, it's kind of interesting to think as a student, well, it's always been around. It was created in my lifetime, and you know, I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? 1970s, yeah. Um, and it was set up actually uh, to provide a more socially just and equitable system. It was not actually set up to govern education for the United States, and it's just an interesting challenge there. Um, and then, of course, in medicine, it's long been recognized that education is a key um, mechanism for healthier lives. So let me zoom on and spend a few minutes just chatting um, about these new models of education, whether it's online, personal response systems or clickers, uh, new technologies. We build these computer simulations in our group. Um, and new technologies, I consider social technologies. How is it that we have people engaging and interacting? Um, and so to begin with, when we talk about new models in education, we have to redefine education. What's the old model of education? What's the old theory of education or the theory of learning if you're on the student side of this enterprise? How is this room set up? Sage on the stage. Sage on the stage, right? Which, too bad you got me, but I'll try and make it more interactive. Um, the point is our old model of education was that of content delivery. Um, and the great philosopher, uh, Bill Waterston, um, captured it. Uh, with this image from Calvin and Hobbes about education. It treats students as empty vessels to be filled up with something that is alienating to them and they're on a conveyor belt. Now we know better than this. This is actually, education doesn't work this way. I cannot learn for a student. I can't transmit. I mean, here's an interesting thing. What am I transmitting to you? If you take this transmissionist view that I can transmit knowledge to you, what is it that I'm transmitting right now? Words, Words yes, absolutely. But literally, what am I transmitting to you? What am I transmitting to you? Sound waves. Sound waves. Or since I'm from Boulder, energy, man. <laughs> right? I'm tickling the cilia in your ears. And we've, because we're part of a common social system, we have language. And those pressure waves are, are translated into meaning. But you've got to do the work on that enterprise. If education was simply access to information or simply the transmission of information, you all would be brilliant because you had this in your pocket. But it's, it's not clear to me that this makes us any smarter. In fact, quite the opposite, perhaps. It gives us more access to information. But what we do with that information, how we understand and organize that information is what I call knowledge. We're in the knowledge game. We're in the questioning game. We're in the game of defining what questions should be answered in this enterprise. So if education is not simply the transmission of information, then what is it? And this is, I think, really important because we, we spend a lot of time in practice doing it learning and teaching and engaging. But it's important to have sort of a model of what it is that we're about. And to me, there are lots of different approaches to say what is education about. But to me, education is about socialization. It's about technically enculturating people or bringing people into a community so that you walk and squawk and talk like a physicist, mathematician, chemist, you know, San Luis Valley in Coloradan, right? American. We socialize people in particular ways and educate them, formally and informally, in all kinds of ways. And we do give them access to information. And it's really important to know that pi is not 3 or 22 sevenths, no matter what various state legislatures want you to believe. 
um, or legislate. And so it's important to have access to facts and information for sure. But knowing what to do that, how you talk about it, what's valued, what is a legitimate question inside a physics class, and what's not? Why do I need to go over to a philosophy class? Or what should, how should physics grow and change? This is what it means to um, engage. So what we're looking to do is to change our classrooms from places that look like this. But I mean, this is literally built into the structure of our classrooms, this transmission model, which we know to be flawed. So we want to switch it and have students engaging and debating and you know, working on um, really exciting interactive environments. So there are many research-based uh, tools building on these theories and models that we engage in, and they're in physics and elsewhere, and I'll share more with you. There are lots of approaches. I know uh, my colleague Valerie um, and uh, Lori Langdon have been down here and chatted about this learning assistant program to um, make part of the education of students the education of other students. And it's not that faculty are trying to abdicate their responsibility or jobs, but in fact, teaching is a fabulous way for learning. And students have more privilege to access to understand what other students are thinking than I do in this way. So we differentiate our roles and we um, empower people here. And so I won't go into that unless you want to sort of chat and ask about that. But we Im radically improve how much students learn in our classes by employing these new interactive techniques. And so what do I uh, mean by that? Well, we're moving from this idea of simply listening to science to practicing and doing science the way scientists do and asking questions. And then what we can do from this is to say, aha, you're so good as a physicist, you should go be a teacher. And if that doesn't work out, go to grad school. That's fine. Right? Or you'll be a better graduate student after you've been a teacher for a while as an enterprise. So here are some uh, measures of outpack um, pack for student learning. I mean, so what's really remarkable, and one of the take homes is that I want from today is for you to understand that education is a scholarly um, pursuit. It is an intellectually rich area, has a long tradition. Here is some work from my colleagues in physics from the 1980s um, here. This paper came out when I was uh, actually starting to teach myself when I was a teenager. Um, uh, they measured how much students were learning in their classrooms in this traditional stage on the stage. And so this happens to be physics, and my apologies to um, the mathematicians, but this is what happens when mathematics gets applied to the world, is that we study things. Sorry, I'm teasing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we study students' understanding of foundational ideas here and ask students, if you take two objects and you, um, one heavy and one light, but they're the same size, and you drop them, do they hit at the same time or at different times? Which one hits first on um, this enterprise? And you can ask students at the beginning of class and at the end of class and all of a sudden see if they're answering these questions differently. And we would call that difference in performance. Notice they're just bubbling in a sheet. The difference in performance, we can call that difference a proxy measure of learning which in fact is better done by looking at what they do. But here's a student's performance on a series of conceptual questions in four different areas. And when they, after instruction and after homework and after lecture um, in this class, students you know, uh, scored almost as high as 50% performance um, at the University of Washington work. And subsequently, they implemented this new interactive technique with tutorials where students are practicing doing science here with coaching and engaging in this and they performed much better on these series of, of surveys and performance. This is from 1981. So the question is, so that's one, is we, they took a scholarly approach to studying what students understand and addressing the challenges that they had. And another hallmark of science is replicability. Can you move a material from a, a curricular approach and a pedagogical uh, approaches from the University of Washington, so move it a thousand miles in three decades? And the answer is, and much easier to move a laser system from Seattle to Boulder than it is to move a pedagogical enterprise. But in fact, we did, and here are the outcomes on these same measures. Remarkably similar outcomes, suggesting that this is a replicable, it is a scholarly pursuit with replication. So these are on uh, other measures here, the force concept inventory for those who are familiar with it, but measures of students' performance. We can look at um, how well students are um, performing, how much do they learn in a class here. In traditional classes, students learn in one, of, one in four of the most basic ideas that they don't already know in our physics classes. And until we started changing that with a reformed class, the transformed classes, using learning assistance, having students interact, now they learn two in four of the most basic ideas. That's not as high, and it depends. We can get into saying, well, how is it that we can push the needle on that? And is it a limitation of the instrument? These are all really good questions. So these are um, data that we collected early on. This is actually a slide that I show the regents. I try and show it like before, after, very simple pictures for people to learn. Um, better, not as good. So um, 
There was a great paper by our colleagues at University of uh, Washington who did a study of 225 such studies. They included ours and theirs. And they came to the conclusions that the experiments, educational experiments, interactive versus traditional classes, analyzed here, had been conducted as a randomized controlled trials in the medical world. Okay. They may have been stopped for benefit, which it would have been immoral to continue with the studies because we know the impact of um, the, the medical intervention, the pill that you were taking, was so profound that everybody should be taking the blue pill, right? So then my question is, if we know this in education, why are we withholding educational treatment? <clears throat> Not only do we know how to better educate people, um, but we're recruiting. I mean, look, we had no students over a five-year period go from chemistry into chemistry teaching. These are the number of students in uh, areas of highest need in the STEM fields um, who are recruited to be teachers. And so they're not high numbers here, although math, we, we're getting 10 coming out versus, I mean, increased by a factor of, of uh, eight uh, over here. Um, yeah, roughly tenfold increase in physics. And it was really hard for the one third student who graduated <laughs> um, each year. Um, so we used to have one, you know. And so now we have three, and it doesn't sound like three is a lot. And I would love to get five, or actually, if we put more concerted effort in it in my department, in physics and astrophysics, I believe we could easily do 10 and place these people in, in wonderful careers and wonderfully, uh, uh, wonderful lives for themselves. Intellectually rich, rewarding, socially mindful, and financially lucrative, it turns out. So um, it has to be done the right way. Um, so we haven't gotten there, but this number of three per year isn't bad, given that each year, despite there being 3,000 instructors in front of a physics classroom for the first time in, in our high school environments in the United States, only 400 physics majors get licensed as teachers each year. So we're nearly 1% of the, the US production, just at one institution. So anyway, there are loads and loads of materials that we know how to better educate students, give them a broader access to understanding um, in the world. So we have stuff across the suite in all of our physics courses, and this is one of the nice things, is we've brought, beg, borrowed, stolen, and adapted these materials, and now are externalizing them for people to use um, across the board. And this is true across life sciences, earth sciences, computer science, physics, statistics, chemistry, and math through um, Carl's initiatives at the University of British Columbia and at CU. And of course, um, uh, we are now making national data repositories here at Carleton and the Science Education Resource Center across fields um, in these different ways. So we know how to better educate students, but then the question is, who are we educating? And I might wrap up with this and then immediately move on to questions unless you have. But uh, so in physics, physics does not shine in terms of its representation. Um, it, physics looks a lot like this. And that is not good for physics, and it's not good for um, our society writ large. Um, so we've been studying uh, issues about uh, how do we make our environments more inclusive and more supportive. I'll show you some uh, research studies that we've been uh, conducting on being more inclusive for women in our introductory sequence. So, um, you know, people are excited that the number of women uh, getting bachelor's degrees uh, was increasing, the fraction of bachelor's degrees granted um, to women was increasing, but it, it is not only stalled, but dipped um, in this enterprise. So it's roughly one in five right now, um, uh, despite there being more women in the United States than men um, in this enterprise. And it might have something to do with answers to questions like this. We ask students at the end of the semester, I feel like I could be a good physicist. And the percentage of students in class answer, you don't want anybody to disagree with this, frankly. I think it's our job in a physics classroom in physics one to say everybody can do physics. Not everybody should be a physicist per se, but I can do physics. Um, but we're definitely disproportionately alienating women in our classes and in our society. It doesn't only come from our classes. So one route we have a, um, it turns out some of these issues have to do with uh, the psychology of what goes on in the class. Who feels like they belong there? and. Uh, is, uh, who here might be familiar with stereotype threat? It's a psychological um, a term coined by Claude Steele when he was at Stanford um, there. And um, it's the uh, stereotype threat uh, is the psychological condition that if you feel like you will reinforce a negative stereotype for a group, 
that you may be affiliated with, if you are, if you are concerned with reinforcing a negative stereotype about a group that you might be identified with, even if you don't personally identify with a group or personally identify with a negative stereotype, like white men can't jump, all right, as a negative stereotype, then at a task that would involve eliciting that uh, uh, condition, like if I'm asked to do basketball layups in this enterprise, you will perform worse at that task. This has been shown for white men in basketball layups, as a matter of fact, by Jeff Cohen, Claude Steele student. This has been shown for African American and uh, white students in reading and math performance. It's been shown for Asian men and white men in math performance uh, in a class, for men and women in a math class in this. So if you are worried about reinforcing a negative stereotype, say about being a female in a physics class, then you will perform worse you will perform less well than your mastery of that subject because you're, it, it's a psychological impact. We don't actually understand the mechanisms of it. So it challenges self-integrity and identity. We also know that. You no longer identify as a physicist. But there's an intervention that has been uh, constructed, and it was actually constructed for middle school students in reading um, for African-American youth called self-affirmation. They spend time doing writing exercises. And for those of you who followed Saturday Night Live from a certain era, this isn't necessarily Stuart Smalley. Um, there, but it is. You go into a physics class and you write about values that matter to you. And you see those things as mattering inside a physics class. And so we created a traditional psychology experiment, two by two randomized uh, design. What we mean is you're either male or female and either you wrote about values that were important to you or you wrote about values that were important to somebody else. Everybody did a writing exercise and um, this was issued two 15 minute writing exercises writing exercises, once in the large physics lecture hall and once as part of the homework assignment here um, at week four. So there's an affirmation exercise here, took about 15 minutes, then they took this conceptual survey of performance and then we gave this booster exercise and then later on we gave them exams and we um, measures of student learning. And what's interesting about this is that the students' uh, performance here on this conceptual mastery, how well do you know this subject here? Um, You'll see this is a standard gender gap, and we've seen this repeatedly in our work. Without um, any kind of inter intervention, the men outperform the women by about 13 points. And so we don't know why that is, necessarily. It could be that the men were better prepared and knew more of the material coming in. It could also be a psychological impact where all of a sudden, if you have give the women uh, these writing exercises, they perform as well as the men. Maybe even better. It matters on your grades. The grades that were issued to people, same grades were given to um, students in the, uh, um, for men, the control condition and the affirmation condition. So if you were a man, the um, writing didn't do anything for or against you in this enterprise. And yet if you were a woman in this, your grades dramatically shifted from the C range to the B range in this enterprise. It's not a simple turnkey solution and there are lots of features behind this. But it has been a replicated study, both at our own institution and others. There are, these also have been failed replication studies of this, that people have tried this. People tried this in a biology, uh, a, a life science, a physics for life sciences major uh, course, where the class was already 50-50 men, male and female. In fact, it was 60-40 female, male, and they didn't show these same results, interestingly enough. <clears throat> why does this matter? There's lots of reasons why this matters, but the number one game on our campus um, is student uh, retention, they've changed the word retention to persistence or to student success. I think that's actually improvement in the language we use. Um, but what we want to do is we want to increase the uh, uh, graduation rate for students. And I, I can get into this if you're interested in looking at the national uh, rates, they're, they're terrible. We don't do a good job of supporting the students who arrive on our um, institutional campuses. Um, within six years of arriving at the Boulder campus, uh, um, if you arrived, 68 out of 100 students will graduate within six years um, on our campus. And the answer is, what are we doing for the other 32 students um, on those campuses? And it's yet worse nationally, and it's yet worse in the STEM fields in this. So what's going on? And one leading factor um, that has been shown in the literature 
um, that matters is a sense of belonging. Do I belong here? Should I be doing this? And this is not only um, important for the institutional scale because money's at stake. If we increase the student retention and persistence rates by 1% on our campus, $4 million in revenue is captured. At least that's the analysis that's been shared with us um, in that enterprise. It also happens to be the moral thing to do, and it's reasonable that we should be educating our students um, uh, who arrive expecting to graduate. Um, so what's interesting is if you look at um, students from Physics 1 to Physics 2, do you continue on in physics? You see what the lead predictors, this is structural equation modeling, I won't get into it, um, but these are sort of like correlation coefficients, not quite. Um, how well do, does sense of belonging, we ask them how well do you belong here, ask them a series of uh, questions from a psychologist. Self-efficacy, how capable do I believe I am at accomplishing this task? Am I capable at, and so this idea of self-efficacy, do I believe in my ability to do basketball layups or perform physics, uh, solve physics problems? So this is a sense of how, how, uh, how strongly do I believe in my capacity? And then there's a measure of performance. And for men, the leading factor, in fact, the only one that directly loads um, to going from physics one to physics two is exam score. Belonging matters, but not statistically when you account for this. In fact, sense of self-efficacy is not statistically significant, but negative. Somewhat interesting for men. For women, how well you perform in the class doesn't impact whether or not you stay. Let me repeat that. Women's performance in the physics class does not, is not a predictor of whether you will stay in the physics class. The women who leave physics or other STEM fields, as has been shown by my colleague Elaine Seymour and um, others um, in a book talking about leaving, the people who leave, the women who leave, are the ones who can. And they choose to for other reasons, like environment, sense of belonging, climate, teaching capacity. Um, what is it like being in this? So women in our studies, the sense of belonging is the lead factor and very strong, in fact, even a more strong indicator of whether or not you stay than uh, men's uh, exam scores. Quite remarkable. The environments we create in our classroom matter. Letting students know you belong, letting fellow students know you belong, that we're in it together. That doesn't mean that physics shouldn't be hard. With all of our physics majors who graduate, invariably the number one thing, everyone who marches across the stage gets to say something, and they all talk about what a pain in the ass um, solving electricity and magnetism problems were late at night, but it was one of the greatest bonding experiences they had because they got to do it with each other. They had a sense of community and belonging that got built, not intentionally by the physicist by giving really lousy physics problems, but it has a nice sideline outcome that, that we got to do this together. This is a social, even physicists are social creatures because they're just like humans. <laughs> um, I will leave this if you want. We have some really fabulous studies and in fact I'll just, um, I'll give you a teaser. Um, so we issued a 14,000 person introductory physics class, which sounds really large because I guess it is. The students who finished the online physics class outperformed our students who were in our brick and mortar 800-person um, class taught by the US Physics Teacher of the Year, Mike Dubson. If you want to know more, and if you want to know why I think that those data don't matter and why MOOCs are still garbage, ask me. Um, well, we'll come back to that in Q&A. Let me just sort of wrap up very briefly here. Um, Simply to say, institutional structures and centers and places for people to go and to be are essential um, at our institutions. This is why we formed our Center um, for STEM Learning. It allows us to move across layers. I mean, this happens more naturally at a smaller place like Adams State, but it's really still important that we can connect students to the people who are making decisions about students' lives because at best, they reflect on their own experience from about 250 years prior when they were undergraduates. All right. But it's a way of creating a holistic and moving across sectors, as well as connecting us to national um, professional organizations and other institutions. So the physicists talk to the physicists and the chemists and the mathematicians. So it's a way, it's a portal into the institution to bring ideas in. It's a communication mechanism across these institutions. And one of the things that I'm really thrilled about is helping the state. The state actually has a STEM education roadmap, which originally didn't include higher education and now it does. I'm really grateful for their involvement, uh, their um, commitment to that. But the state has stated that it'll be the most innovative state in the country. Wow, most innovative state in the country, growing local talent pipeline. That's here. 
um, by ensuring all learners have access to STEM education and experiences needed to succeed. Why? Because of our innovation economy. Right? But not bad. That's a, that's a nice statement. The state wants to engage in that, invest in that. It's created regional sectors um, here, and I think that's actually an important strategy for this, and there's ways. But I want us to think about this as a state. I want us to think about having regional centers, and maybe we can serve as a national hub here for a, a huge investment up at Colorado, and actually connecting our institutions. This is what I said to begin with. I have a not-so-hidden agenda that I'm really interested in. And the nice thing is we don't have to just rest it with our two. We can create one throughout the state. In fact, we're in a national enterprise in this. And this has already been formed, that we have a national network of STEM education centers to allow and share information, to share resources, and to support the tremendous work that's going on um, here. We have two new um, large-scale efforts on our campus that can engage um, and uh, uh, support the kinds of local efforts that are going on here. Um, so there's a website here and I'll gladly share these slides with you all, um, but you can also uh, Google Network of STEM Education Centers and it'll show up. Um, bottom line though, why does that matter? And the answer is it matters because we're acting where it, it, it matters most, in the classroom, as learners and as teachers. Um, we're working across, this is my office, please come visit sometime, but we're working across entire departments um, at a time here, and we're working across the entire institution. We must think about these as universities rather than as isolated uh, departments. We will uh, reclaim the promise of what really is truly uh, an American experiment in investing in our own society through investment in a higher education. We're not the only ones thinking this way. There are lots of different networks that are engaged in this and are sort of spreading nationally. We're very strongly connected in building many of these. Um, and there are tremendous resources that can be brought to, get, to bear and support the very local work that you all are doing. So thank you very much. So I'll happily take any questions. Yeah so, um, yeah, so the question is, uh, have we uh, conducted any studies across ethnic or racial boundaries and looking at the different demographics, which is hugely important? And the answer is we've tried, but the uh, uh, racial variation in the physics department at CU Boulder is, well, appalling. Um, so um, we have not, others have. We participate in the American Physical Societies. They have a bridge program there to increase the number of African-American PhDs that are awarded. So as of five years ago, interestingly enough, how many PhDs are awarded to um, African-Americans in physics each year in the United States? There are a thousand PhDs awarded in physics in the United States each year, roughly. 2% all come from uh, Boulder. So the answer is 30. The American Physical Society wanted to increase that to 60 by creating a new program, doubling that, which is really remarkable. Um, still not at parity with representation um, of these um, communities. So it is, that is being conducted as an action research experiment, trying to apply the best practices of interventions and studying the nature of those. But, um, so we have not conducted those studies, others are. Um, and that's just in the physics community. Um, um, but it, it's slowly catching on. Engineering, I mean, thank goodness for, um, uh, I think it's mechanical engineering, because they're the only ones who make physics look good by way of representation. Um, uh, computer sciences and all that far further ahead, there was actually an experiment that radically increased the number of women and that has since dropped, which is really interesting to study. So it will vary by domain and discipline and it also will um, vary by institutional type and racial and ethnic demographics. So there's lots of work to be done. In fact, I was just wrote this up this morning that this is one of the um, larger grand challenges that must span each of the education research fields across domains, these discipline-based education researchers, the chemists, biologists, mathematicians, um, engineers, who are, and physicists who are, are spending time thinking about education in their disciplines need to get together and think about these cross-cutting issues that include uh, issues of, of representation. So um, there's some, but not enough. Yes. Yeah. So innovation has been a big buzzword lately, frankly. And because I have a liberal education, I know that the Latin root of innovation means not to create from scratch, but to renew. 
Um, and I think people usually miss that. When people think about something innovative, they want to chuck everything that's been done rather than saying, no, 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 let's build from our strengths and renew our commitment and engage. So that's the sense that I like to use innovation. Now, that's not the way it was meant in the state document. They say we want to chuck everything and do you know, something completely new. But I'm still willing to reclaim the, the origins of that um, a word and recognize this is how we'll do it. The other piece about this, and I, I have to credit my colleague Sanjoy Mahajan, who at the time was at Cambridge and is now at Olin College in, in um, Boston, for saying, look, the physics community for too long, the people who are thinking about education in physics, the physics community have wanted to make better problem solvers. And to me, Sanjoy, but also me, Noah, um, says that's totally insufficient. I don't want to make better problem solvers. I want students to know whose problems they're solving. I want to make better questioners. You make a better questioner, you become a better problem solver um, in that enterprise. And that's what innovation is to me in that way. So yes, that is being done. This work about project-based learning that's going on, collaborative learning, authentic learning practices, research experiences where students go in and engage and actually do real science. What does it mean to do real science? Answer questions that haven't been um, asked before. So you define the question, and you answer questions in new ways, and students are wholly capable of doing this. It's, it's remarkable, the capacity of our students, when we engage and allow them to do this. I think the pendulum can swing too far. We have entrepreneur programs where, no joke, elementary school students are engaged in business practices and learning business practices in order to innovate and sell products. I think that that might be the tail wagging the dog. Um, in this enterprise, I think what we really need is, this goes back to what are the goals of education um, in this enterprise, and if we lead about empowering individuals and lead about advancing society, then innovation will be done the right way. How is it that we solve societally based problems? Angie Calabrese Barton has some just fabulous work on this, which is to say students go out as part of their physics class or math class or biology class and figure out what are the problems in the local environment? What matters in San Luis Valley here? What is forms of civic engagement that we can engage in to learn physics and do original physics? There are plenty of questions that have never been asked about the local environment here. And so you can still learn Newton's laws in this way. We haven't figured out how to do that. So that's my sort of medium-sized answer um, to that. And there are really some nice models about how to go about doing that. But it, it, it takes, I guess, um, I heard the word courage earlier on in another talk today. It takes courage both for our students and for our faculty to engage in these enterprises. But it is immensely rewarding when we do. I have a physics class, one of a, I mean, it, it actually counted as a laboratory class when I developed it at UC San Diego. I had a uh, like laboratory like play with oscilloscopes and you had to take two lab classes. So I had students going out and teaching in after school programs in order to learn physics. And they created those programs. And I got it to count as an experimental class, as a class for experiment, because they were measuring and they're coming up with measurement uh, systems in their enterprise. And they were learning about the nature of statistics and analysis in that way. And you know, first people were like, wait a sec, this isn't an oscilloscope. It's like, yeah, no, 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 it's much more important than an oscilloscope. Um, but you learn the experimental techniques in this way. And so it, that's you know, the kinds of things that we can think innovatively about. I'll give you a, a very, yeah, there's actually some really, I'll just give you, a, and it's too fun not to share, and I'm sensitive to time for you all. Um, um, so we ran, as part of MOOC mania, um, we ran one of these uh, um, uh, studies here. Um, and definitely feel free to um, jet when you need to. But you see the title is when you compare a brick and mortar class and a, a MOOC, it's like, it's not even apples and oranges. It's like um, apples and the concept of love, you know. Um, <laughs> so I highlight that this is not a new idea. This idea of broad, I mean, think about the model of education that's embedded in our classroom of the future from 1930, where there's a professor. I mean, it's really interesting to look at who's the professor and who's the students and how does it happen and think about the era of, of when this was and what doesn't change. Um, here's a, a classroom of the future from uh, 1958 um, here. Now look at who the teacher is and what the students are, and there's a flying something or another over here, sort of out of the Jetsons, I think, for those who... Follow that. Um, one thing I love about this is one thing remains invariant. If you look at the equation here, um, hopefully our mathematicians appreciate this. Um, it's just wrong. <laughs> um, so we compared a traditional course, um, uh, 800 students, uh, 14,000 students in our MOOC, and a residence-based program for um, our uh, most vulnerable students, uh, first-gen students. and. Um, those students who are under uh, supported and underprepared in 
previous experience but show tremendous promise in a residence-based gold shirt program in our engineering. Same content taught in all of these. Um, this was 30 students. So this is the online class. This is Mike Dubson teaching and we had like videos running and he made it really interactive. I mean, no joke, he's as compelling as you could have it. Um, I, I watched the first video and he's like, all right, I want you to all pick up your piece of paper and I'm just sitting there watching this. And he says, no, 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 I just saw you. You didn't pick up your paper. Pick it up. And then I like picked up my paper. <laughs> and I'm um, following him. So it's like, really, he's amazing um, as a communicator and educator. And it's, it's really dynamic. We also um, hacked the system to put in interactive uh, uh, systems here that weren't allowed originally in Coursera um, and forced students to answer questions. So we made it as parallel as possible in these environments. And then we measured students' performance at the end of the class. And the students who finished and got a certificate in the class and the students who um, actually just finished the class um, outperformed the students who were in our brick and mortar class here and outperformed the students in the um, uh, residence-based class. And that's where a lot of politicians stop. But in fact, it doesn't measure learning. This is the pretest score. This is how much students knew coming in. The students who came into this um, MOOC actually knew as much as the students leaving a brick and mortar class. So there was higher, greater learning. In fact, the greatest learning happened in this um, interpersonal class. And you look at the number of students. Out of 14,000, 42 actually got a certificate. 136 actually finished the class. Ridiculous, like 1% retention rate in this class. Whereas we had 85% in our brick and mortar, which still isn't where we want to go. And 100% in the personalized class in this environment. And then the question is, who are these students? These students are men who already had bachelor's degrees and were in their 40s. So um, that tells you a little bit about um, the nature of the system. So we have to be very careful about when we claim that MOOCs are the catch-all. And people have figured that out already, and they're adapting that. But that's the quick take-home version for that. So again, thank you very much. I'll stick around and answer other questions.